So I welcome you all to this course, uh, MSc 626A. Uh, and the title of the course, as you all know, is Transport Phenomena. Uh, and it's a compulsory course for the graduate students in the department of MSc. It's a very important and core engineering course. Uh, and that's why we have made it compulsory in our curriculum. Uh, this course, although is a graduate level course, it is not really administered at the graduate level because we at the department level thought that many of you are not exposed uh, to transport phenomena course at a sufficiently you know, uh, advanced level uh, or moderate level even. So that we have a diverse background of students. So we thought that you know, it would be good to have a compulsory course uh, mostly telling about the basic principles of transport phenomena. And when I talk, we talk of transport phenomena, those of you who may not be knowing, we are basically talking of uh, fluid dynamics, heat transfer, and mass transfer processes. So there's a very important engineering subject, and uh, uh, it is uh, one of the core subjects concerned with all the disciplines where we have you know, uh, design, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. Now, before I come to the uh, application of the course with respect to uh, the metal uh, and metals and materials engineering, uh, I would like to say that I'm going to give you a, a handout and which I will be distributed uh, through uh, your e email alias, that's uh, the course alias, which is MSE 626A. So, this handouts basically will tell you the course content, uh, the number of lectures that I will be taking this semester, uh, which is basically about 40 contact hours, including today's lecture, which is introductory in nature. And this lecture actually is concerned about introducing you to the con contents of the course, as well as uh, you know, uh, the application of transport phenomena in materials engineering. And from the next lecture onwards, we will get into the core of the subjects and we will discuss uh, transport phenomena principles, mostly concerning with fluid flow, heat transfer, and mass transfer. The course has uh, three modules. Uh, the number one module is the fluid dynamics module. And there we have seven lectures. Uh, and five lectures are going to be administered as per the syllabus. And we have two sessions on problem solving also. This subject, as you all know, is a highly quantitative subject, so it requires some analytical skill, and at the end of the day, uh, we also demand that you have good, uh, you know, understanding or ability uh, to handle uh, softwares uh, which are often used to perform the calculation, particularly at the advanced level. So, so following seven lectures, uh, including two problem solving sessions in uh, fluid dynamics, we will be talking about heat transfer for about 16 lectures. Uh, and out of these 16 lectures, five sessions, we will be spending mostly on solving of problems uh, which will have you know, application towards materials processing. We will not get problems from all disciplines, but we will uh, you know, construct problems specifically targeting to metallurgical or materials engineering problems. And the third and the last module of the course is uh, the mass transfer module. Again, we will have 16 lectures there. So 16 mass transfer, 16 heat transfer, 7 fluid dynamics, that makes it 39. And today being the first lecture, so 39 plus 1, that is the 40 contact hours. Uh, regarding uh, the evaluation procedure, that will be, you know, again intimated to you through emails. So I'll do that a little bit later when you have advanced sufficiently. And I would say that uh, I would be following uh, three textbooks as far as, uh, you know, administering this course is concerned. And these are all written by metallurgical engineers. Uh, one is uh, engineering in process metallurgy. Engineering in process metallurgy. And that's written by uh, R. Guthrie. So you can actually look at internet sites and find out that for R. Uh, the books located, they are all available in our institute library also in the reserved as well as in the reference section. Then we have an introduction to transport phenomena. 
an introduction to transport phenomena. In materials engineering, and this is written by uh, Professor Gaskell, dear Gaskell. They all have lots of problems actually, and uh, at your leisure, I will also be giving you assignment sheets, but I will expect that you will, you know, since these books are available in the library, you will go through them, you will take initiative and solve problem. Uh, on your own. And the third one is a specific book on mass transfer in solids and liquids. Mass transfer in solids and liquids. By Professor Wilkinson. Wilkinson. I think it is D.S. Wilkinson, if I'm not wrong. So these are the th three textbooks that I will be mostly referring as far as administering this course is concerned. And as I have indicated, these books are also available in the library. And as far as the general subject of transport phenomena is concerned, you know, on topic of like heat transfer, mass transfer, etc., there are a plethora of books. Innumerable books are there. You can read any of those. But I think if you want to see the application of the subject to metals and materials processing, perhaps you will have to consider you know, looking into these books because they are written by people who are essentially all a metallurgical or materials engineering. Now, this subject, as I have indicated right in the beginning, uh, is a core engineering subject. And this subject is therefore taught, uh, you know, for all those disciplines where we have uh, design and manufacturing uh, as important exercises. I mean, if you look at, I will first talk about its general application, and then I will give you some examples with regard to uh, the application of the subject in materials processing so that you can understand the necessity of studying uh, this course. Okay, so this is transport phenomena and this is we have. Unfortunately, what happens is uh, that this course should have come with a dedicated tutorial session, but the institute's curriculum does not allow us to put a tutorial session in any graduate course. So that's why the problem sessions has been amalgated into the main instruction uh, section. So, but we have to solve a large number of problems in order to get a good hang of the subject. Now, if you look at any engineering discipline, uh, you talk of aeronautical engineering or aerospace engineering, you talk of simply space engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, Everywhere, civil engineering even, you will find that the principles of heat mass momentum transfer are extensively applied. So basically, we are talking about you know, processes uh, uh, where heat transfer is involved, mass transfer is involved, and fluid dynamics is also involved. For example, you know, people who are in aerospace engineering, they are concerned with uh, mostly aircraft designs. In the aircrafts, we have, you know, Combustions as important phenomena, where the fuel combines with you know, uh, oxygen and provides uh, the necessary thrust. Also, the amount of energy that a aircraft spends in traveling, uh, you know, it de depends a lot on the resistance or the resistive force applied by the atmosphere. So the drag is very important there. Drag is nothing but the if the airport is uh, air force is uh, uh, the, you know the aircraft is moving in this direction, the drag will be acting opposite, so it's a resistive force, and the magnitude of the resistive force depends on the surface area, uh, the design of the aircraft, and it has important bearing on the consumption of fuel. So the efficiency of, you know, combustion in, within the aircraft itself, where we have fuel oxygen combustion taking place, there we'll see a lot of heat transfer taking place, okay? And important mechanisms uh, are involved as far as uh, the mixing of the fuel as well as air is concerned, the heat liberation, how you, you know, deal with the exhaust and how you cool uh, so that uh, not excessive amount of temperature is generated. So all these are very important when you go to the subject of, uh, you know, uh, do air, aircraft designing and so on and so forth. If you go to mechanical engineering also, particularly those, those people who are concerned with, for example, 
uh, you know, automotive designs, the internal combustion engines. And again, because the automobile moves, uh, okay, uh, so there's a resistive force both on the ground as well as on the surface because of, uh, you know, uh, the intervening medium. And there the design of the automobile is also very, very important. We are talking about, you know, reduction of strength, uh, reduction of weight, at the ex not at the expense of strength anymore. So we want to have better materials which have better strength so that we can reduce the weight of the vehicle such that the transportation load or the payload we can say is going to be minimal in the case of an automobile which will burn less fuel and become more efficient as far as uh, you know, the driving the vehicle is concerned. Similarly, there are you know, injections of fuel, there are injections of oxygen, heat generation, and all these kinds of things are very, very important uh, as far as uh, you know, uh, running of or designing of an automobile is really concerned. If you go to civil engineering, you find that you have, you know, open channel flow, hydraulic engineering. Even you have, for example, you know, you talk about uh, the atmospheric uh, physics, where the cloud physics actually uh, has a lot of aspects of heat transfer and mass transfer. I recently came across a nice video where I, you know, uh, saw the simulation of ice age uh, on the surface of the planet, how the ice sheet really advanced, and which are basically, you know, uh, the heat transfer mass uh, fluid dynamics calculation uh, embedded into a computer uh, program that has produced that kind of a simulation result. So you, you name any discipline of engineering which is concerned with manufacturing, which is concerned with design, uh, you will find that you know, the heat, mass and momentum transfer principles are extensively applied. Recently the ISRO people came here and they were talking about uh, the designing of the nose of a re-entry vehicle because when you know from the upper space a vehicle enters the earth's atmosphere because of the frictional forces with the atmosphere huge amount of heat is being generated at the nose of the re-entry vehicle and it is very important that the heat generation generated in the you know at the nose region should not uh, degrade the material and lead to its premature failure so the designing of the material to withstand such large heat is very, very important and there again the flow of heat, the generation of heat, etc. are extremely important. Now coming back, you know, to the specific applications uh, in the context of our discipline, uh, we will find that uh, virtually everywhere uh, uh, the principles of heat mass momentum transfer are required. And unfortunately, in our discipline, at the undergraduate level, this subject has not been given uh, adequate uh, attention. So I will give you some examples of application of heat and mass transfer, specifically with regard to metals and materials engineering, you know, talking specifically on the frontiers of, uh, say, extractive metallurgy, physical metallurgy, Mineral engineering, mechanical metallurgy, then we have materials engineering. We have manufacturing everywhere. When I talk of manufacturing, for example, I mean the manufacturing techniques like welding, solidification, and so on. Means welding, solidification, I could have written casting also. Materials engineering, I basically imply, you know, that the designing of the materials, for example, that when you have you know, uh, thin film coating over a surface that essentially comes under the purview of the materials engineering. Mechanical metallurgy, basically talking about the deformation processes and so on and so forth. Mineral engineering, we talk about beneficiation of ores, etc. Physical metallurgy, there we are talking about structure property correlations and extractive metallurgy is, you know, the extraction of metals uh, from their native ores. So these are by far you know, the broad areas of our discipline and I will show you 
in greater detail because in the context of other disciplines I have very loosely made you know uh, or discussed um, the application of transport phenomena in the context of aerospace engineering in the context of mechanical engineering in the context of civil engineering and so on and so forth. But now I want to do it a little bit more lucidly in the context of all these areas which I have written down on the board. Now extractive metallurgy if you take you know I can take many examples for example and extractive metallurgy what we deal basically is we have furnaces that is what we deal we have casters for conversion of liquid uh, we have electricals you know I could say electrochemical when you have electrometallurgical processes for example we can have cells where why where from metals are extracted so we have pyrometallurgical processes we have hydro hydrometallurgical processes we have electrometallurgical processes so in such context we can make a lot of discussion and illustrate that uh, you know what is the application of uh, transport phenomena. For example, if you talk of furnaces, one of the major furnaces as you all know are basically high temperature reactors in metallurgy. So, we are talking about extremely high temperature and there is a need to contain that uh, heat within the furnace itself. So, the designing of the furnace is very, very important. So, we will require material with high insulating capabilities to line our furnaces such that heat cannot really flow out. So, you have to know about thermal conductivity of the material, you have to find out what is an optimum material thickness that will allow least amount of heat to go out of the furnaces and so on and so forth. In the furnaces basically what happens we have reactions which take place. So, all metallurgical process extractive metallurgical processes involve you know chemical reactions because we are talking of ores and from ores extraction of the native materials. Ores are in combined state like we have oxygen combined with iron that gives us the iron ore, oxygen combined with aluminum gives us the bauxite ore and so on and so forth. So, we have to separate these elements uh, in order to extract molten material and if you want to do it in a liquid stage in that case we require really high temperature and that high temperature will allow us you know of which has to be beyond the melting range. Uh, to extract the material in the liquid state. So, there would be various kinds of solid reagents uh, and you all know that the ores are not pure. So, they will have gang materials and these gang materials are also removed in the furnace. So, then the furnace application of heat is concerned in the furnace there is the you know material flow is concerned in the furnace we have solidification uh, in the liquefaction is also concerned there is a change of stage because in the furnace initially we charge material as solid state, but we get out the material in the liquid state. So, there is a change of state of the material as well within the furnace. So, innumerable phenomena really takes place inside a furnace and if you all look for example, you know the gas may be injected at the bottom of a furnace. Suppose if you take a blast furnace, okay? in the blast furnace most of you have studied these at the grade 11 le level. So, you charge material raw material or from the top and you inject a reacting gas from the bottom. So, the gas and the metal comes in contact with each other and this is called a counter current reactor. The efficiency of iron production in the blast furnace largely depends on how efficient the contact between the gas or the charge between the gas and the charge is. So, this is we have oxygen. So, we have carbon monoxide generated here and that carbon monoxide goes up as carbon monoxide goes up iron ore comes down the reduction takes place and the net result is the production of iron and the efficiency or the rate at which iron is producing being produced in the furnace depends on the contact. If all the carbon monoxide is converted into carbon dioxide that means it is able to reduce iron ore then we will have large concentration of CO2 in the furnace exit gas. On the other hand if we have you know very high concentration of CO that means this CO without spending much work without reducing the ore has really flown out of the furnace the whole purpose here is then defeated. Okay? So, therefore, the contact between the gas and the solid most of you those you know have studied in your undergraduate 
when you have done a full fledged iron and steel making course that we require a height of pressure in the blast furnace. The moment you apply a height of pressure in the blast furnace, what happens? The pressure differential between these two points are decreased and as a result of which the gas rises much more slower. Okay? And as a result of which the effective contact time between the iron ore and carbon monoxide, okay, the ascending and the descending column of gases and charges are increased with the net result that we have uh, you know, more efficient iron production. If you, if you talk of casters for example, continuous casting process, ingot casting process and what happens in those casting process? You put in liquid material and you cast, you, you know, you take out heat and as a result of which the solidification takes place. And you all know that during solidification of big castings for example, we have segregation which takes place and then to eliminate segregation what you do? You hit you know after solidification which called removal of the coring defects in, from casting and as a result of which diffusion becomes you know spontaneous at high temperature and you get homogenization in the structure itself. So, mass transfer takes place that is the diffusion of carbon or diffusion of strongly segregated elements like sulfur etc all throughout the structure and heat takes place because you are extracting continuously heat from the liquid material. So, the in the entire subject of context of casters or uh, where solidification of material takes place, we have mass transfer as well as heat transfer taking place you know at a very large scale, widespread scale. So, so we expect that the designing of the mold, okay, the casting condition, how you are going to pour molten material so that it will have less defect and so on and so forth, less segregation that will depend on how well you have been able to control your casting parameters and how well you have been able to design your casters. Similarly, if you go to electromotive cells for example, all the hall cells and you find that the design of the hall cell is extremely important as far as the efficiency of aluminum is and this all these things are at you know at very high temperature. We are not talking of room temperature exercises per se in our discipline. We are always talking of high temperature operations which are significantly higher than at times you know 800, 900 degrees centigrade. When you talk of iron for example, we talk of temperature about 15, 1600 degrees centigrade. When you talk of aluminum, maybe we talk about 1000, 1100 degrees centigrade and so on and so forth. So, in the Hall Herald cell for example, you have cryolite okay, and that cryolite dissolves aluminum, okay, uh, dissolves alumina and that alumina undergoes electrolytic electrolysis. So, the movement of the ions, again movement of the ions, what does this mean? Movement of actually mass, ions have you know, specific masses. So, the movement of the ions towards the respective electrode are influenced by the nature of the convection currents that is generated there, electromotive forces and so on and so forth. So, these are in electrochemistry also, we find huge application of transport phenomena for example, because the electrolytic movement, you know, the activities in and around cathode and anode, they are immensely controlled by various phenomena which produces heat, which produces local stirring condition and so on and so forth. You come to physical metallurgy where we talk about structure and uh, properties of material. And in physical metallurgy, a very common topic that we often uh, study is called is a, is a heat treatment. Uh, and perhaps it, in the context of steel, we have studied heat treatment very extensively. Okay? And this heat treatment allows us to control the microstructure and thereby control the properties of the material. So, for example, we know that if the grain size is smaller, then the strength of the material is higher. If the grain size is coarse, then the strength of the material is poor and so forth and so forth. And so, forth. so, therefore, you know, when you talk of heat treatment operation, for example, uh, we, we find that the heat transfer phenomena really plays a paramount role. In the context of physical metallurgy and particularly in the context of quenching of steel, you have come across a term terminology called the retained austenite. That if when you quench a steel sample to produce martensite for example, and if, this, if the steel sample is too large and the bath where you are plunging the solid material is not too large, in that case what happens? The core never gets a cooling rate which is greater than the critical cooling rate and as a result of which you land up where you have a martensite at the peri, you know, and this is called the retained austenite, where you have not been because the specimen is so thick, you have designed it wrongly, and that 
as a result of which this region does not experience the critical cooling rate and as a result of which the austenite which is they are right in the beginning is retained and this phase is called. So, while this part has cooling rate greater than so it is immersed in a coolant which could be liquid nitrogen which could even be a polymeric solution okay such that we want a, you know, for formation of martensite for example we all want a cooling rate greater than critical cooling rate. Those of you who have studied metallurgy and know the time temperature transformation diagram will immediately understand what I am talking about. So, the formation of the martensite requires critical cooling rate and that critical cooling rate condition may not be satisfied at the internal portion of the system because that will depend on the thermal conductivity of the material you know how big the reservoir is into which you are plunging and so on and so forth. So, therefore, and this retained austenite as you all know it impairs the micro you know the mechanical properties of the material. So, therefore, the cooling rate at different points are going to be really different when you do heat treatment and therefore, the cooling rates must be regulated well in order to arrive at the microstructure because microstructure and phase transformation they are related to the temperature and you all know that you know the phase transformation reaction for example, austenite breaking down into pyrolite and cementite and in this particular context also we can say that the temperature plays a very important role because there are nucleation growth diffusion or all these phenomena simultaneously occurring during the formation of the phases and so on and so forth. So, the heat transfer and mass transfer phenomena because these are mostly solid state processing. So, we are not talking of you know uh, per se any fluid dynamics or the application of fluid dynamics in physical metallurgy operation. Physical metallurgy starts after the cast error or after we have solidified molten material okay, uh, into the solid form. So, it is in the solid form and in the solids we will have mostly you know talking about we will be talking about mostly heat transfer and mass transfer and that too in the solid we know that the mechanism of heat transfer and mass transfer would be conduction as well as diffusion. So, extensive application of diffusion theories as well as conduction theories will be necessary you know in order to design uh, you know physical metallurgy or particularly the heat treatment operations and so on and so forth. Mineral engineering it is concerned with mostly the beneficiation of the ore. So, because most of the ore that we normally uh, get from mines do not contain uh, the requisite amount of uh, you know the valuable materials. So, for example, in the context of blast furnace I would like to tell you that you know in good old days we used to have 65 percent iron ore. So, the volume of slag which is to be produced from such a furnace used to be much less per ton of metal produced, but now we are using the resources you know very rampantly. So, good ores are vanishing uh, quite fast and as a result of which the ore that we are charging no more contains 65 percent iron, it contains lesser and lesser amount of iron and it is said or maybe you all will experience in your lifetime that iron is going to be extracted from an ore which will contain 40, 45 percent iron. So, that means per ton of Fe the volume of the slag or the unwanted material will increase in furnace and the furnace may not be viable. So, what we want to do that before we charge such a lean ore, lean ore means when the concentration of the valuable material is less in the ore. So, the lean ore the prior to its charging into the furnace needs to be concentrated and the concentration needs to be back jacked up to 65 percent or 60 percent and then only that concentrate concentrated material or ore can be charged. So, we call it is a beneficiated ore can be charged into the furnace and the whole objective of mineral engineering is to deal with you know concentrating the lean ore and this is particularly true of non ferrous materials like copper for example or uranium for example, whose presence is not of the order of 60 percent or 50 percent, but 1 percent or even less than uh, you know 0.5 percent in many situations. So, we got to concentrate and there we have devised many processes uh, solid liquid separation process, liquid liquid separation process, air liquid separation process and so on and so forth which are extensively based on the fundamentals of you know transport phenomena mostly uh, fluid dynamics as well as a mass transfer phenomena. Now, if you if you look at the classification process for example, classification basically tells us about 
you know sorting according to the sizes of the particles or separation if you have uh, two different sizes of particles or if you have two different variety of materials which have different densities in that case we can uh, use a classification technique. More specifically suppose I have a mixture of material which has a density of 1.3 and 1.7 but they are very intricately mixed. Okay? Now when you get a lamp pour what we do? We crush and grind that is the first step which you all know is called the liberation process. So once liberation takes place but still we get that there are two different materials which are very intricately mixed. How do you want to separate them? So we will use a material you know a liquid for example having a density of 1.4 or so and then the heavier material will set, settle you know and the lighter material is going to float. So this technique the classification process exploits okay, uh, the fundamentals of uh, fluid dynamics very strongly. Similarly if you have just one single material and we have different size ranges that it has you know 30 micron size, 20 micron size, 80 micron size, 120 micron size then how can you how can you classify or you know we can allow them to settle on a bed and we will see that the top layer is going to be fine particle and the bottom layer is going to be a very heavy particle. So that called that is called the classification process and there are innumerable classification processes. Uh, one such class classification process which all of you may have studied uh, is called uh, you know the hydrocyclones for example where we inject air water and the air water really interacts with the particle together with the centrifugal force okay, and causes separation of different size particles. More importantly if you go to flotation column for example where you have air bubbles injected into the into a fluid medium containing a suspension of such particles. So we will see that some particles are going to be attaching to the bubbles and rising up and some particles will not be attaching and we know that these are called hydrophilic and hydrophobic particles. So by exploiting the surface chemistry principles we will be able to interact with that, that you know how much of gas loading is to be done, what should be the size of the bubbles and these are all directly these all directly fall in the purview of uh, transport phenomena. So we should be able to design flotation column where we can separate particles or classify you know the ores that we have prepared through crushing and grinding. Mechanical metallurgy uh, talks about mostly deformation process all rolling forging etc. They you know come under mechanical metallurgy. So we study stress strain physical metallurgy mostly we have you know structure property correlations as I have indicated in mechanical property we will talk about mostly mechanics of solid uh, deformation theory and so on and so forth. But we must understand that you cannot study deformation process uh, uh, you know in isolation because large scale uh, deformation leads to enormous amount of heat generation in the solid samples. Okay? So therefore the deformation process itself is coupled with uh, the evolution of heat which gets dissipated within the solid and when you do for example uh, mechanical metallurgy operation for example you imagine the roll rolling and you have rolls which are at a relatively low temperature because you do not want the rolls to get deformed at high temperature. But the slab which may be moving through the rolls okay, so you, these slabs could be you know at a very high temperature typically if you take two rolls and you have So this is the slab I am talking about. So this must be at recrystallization temperature which is for steel maybe about you know 1000 degrees centigrade or so and these are the rolls which are continuously water cooled and at the roll solid interfaces huge amount of you know temperature is generated and those temperature are going to be dissipated transferred into the roll and as a result of which what happens is the roll can undergo deform undergo deformation and once the roll undergoes deformation you will not be able to maintain the thickness of the sample as you have originally desired. So cooling of the roll is very very important you cannot allow the rolls you know to acquire a temperature which is uh, more than the design uh, you know the tolerance level uh, even though this may be at about 1100 or 1200 degree centigrade. So the, not only the designing of the roll the designing of the roll of course is important you know. Uh, you have to find out that what should be the 
strength of the material and so on and so forth. So, we will require physical metallurgy and mechanical metallurgy principles, but that alone is not sufficient. You have to do lot of heat transfer calculations also in this particular case in order to ensure that having designed the role, how to protect the role such that it does not really undergo any deformation and jeopardize and the operation itself. So, simultaneous knowledge of temperature or heat evolution in the solid in the rolls are extremely important in the context of mechanical metallurgy. And also you will see that you know you have nucleation growth etcetera, fresh recrystallization takes place and you have diffusion also which occurs at high temperature of course, that if you high temperature will try to level up concentration uh, differential if any that exists within the solid, but mostly you will see that uh, you know uh, the knowledge of temperature or the heat transfer theories are extremely important as far as uh, studies of the deformation process. So, what the essentially what I am trying to say the deformation phenomena you cannot really study in mechanical metallurgy simply by considering stress strain and disregarding entirely uh, you know the heat transfer part which is extremely important uh, in such context. Materials engineering, you can I can give you an example of CVD process for example. CVD as you all know is a chemical vapor deposition process. Okay? So, you want to do a coating on a surface and this is very rampant in you know preparation of samples uh, with a improved surface characteristics or laminations and here again you have you know extensive application of heat mass momentum transfer principles. In chemical vapor deposition what happens? You have a substrate and then you have a spray gun. From the spray gun you have you know droplets which come down and these droplets comes and ejects you know falls on the sur substrate and as a result of which a coating is prepared on the surface itself. I have put it very easily, but the process is not so easy. Actually it is extremely complex process because the generation of micro droplets okay, or the sprays okay, and the distance of travel that temperature because you know if the if, if you have sil not selected the parameters properly the droplet may come out in the liquid state, but before touching the substrate itself it may solidify and the whole purpose may get defeated. Okay? The droplets come down, impinges, spreads and solidifies and all these phenomena that are integral part of chemical vapor deposition is actually behind them you will see you know uh, the principles of fluid dynamics heat transfer and mass transfer unless you really know fluid dynamics heat transfer and mass transfer or transport phenomena you really cannot design a CVD apparatus for any meaningful job. Finally, I can also give you some example from the manufacturing sector where you will find that you have extensive application of uh, fluid flow heat transfer and uh, mass transfer. Let me raise the board and then I think I will explain that <coughs> how in solidification, how in welding heat and mass transfer really is important. So, when you if you take welding for example, then you have two similar or dissimilar pieces of material which are joined together by the application of heat. So, you have a gun okay, from which the heat is being generated. So, you have filler material and that filler material fills and solidifies the job. And the objective is that the joint should be sufficiently strong okay, to withstand uh, the load to which the sample may eventually be subjected. In the entire process there is you know the flow of the material filler we call it as you all know filler material. The filler material fills these joints you must understand that the filler material must have appropriate properties so that it should be able to you know fill in the voids between the two material itself. So, its properties are very important melting point, surface tension etcetera. More important when you apply heat here okay, and the filler material melts, you have what is known as a, a weld pool here which is generated or a heat affected zone which is being generated, HZ heat affected zone. So, here for example, various phenomena really takes place in the weld pool we know that Marangoni effects takes place surface tension driven you know the flow which are driven by surface tension. We will study that flow 
of fluid really will require the application of forces and various kinds of forces will be there and one such force is the surface tension force and that surface tension force is very very important in the context of all. So, the dimension is very small we are talking of 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter or 3 centimeter region, but within that we have a liquid pool ok. We have liquid filler material which is flowing into the crevices here and then solidifying diverse phenomena is really taking place and you see so many things I have said you know the flow of the filler material into the crevice flow fluid flow we have talked about application of heat ok for melting and we are talking about phase change because we are talking about melting. Then we have a heat affected zone where the microstructure of steel or the specimen substrate material can actually undergo changes. So, for example, if you have started with a ferritic material and if this part acquires a temperature of more than 900 degrees centigrade it can very well undergo a phase change and become austenitic and so on and so forth. So, that is why it is said. So, everywhere it is the original structure, but within this region the heat affected zone we have a temperature you know um, we have a structure which is not same as that of the original uh, or the parent material and that is why it is called the heat affected zone and this can really deteriorate. So, the way you apply heat the way the filler material flows and gets itself welded to the surfaces thereby forming a big joint are extremely important and the entire what should be the power of the heat, what should be the filler material, what should be the proximity of the two blocks or the two substrate uh, pieces all these things are not arbitrarily they are really obtained by performing rigorous calculations which are based on the principle of heat transfer mass transfer and uh, fluid flow. Finally, I would like to say a few things about solidification which of course, I have loosely mentioned earlier and solidification is such an important and the most of you have done an engineering manufacturing course at the second year level we have a course like TA201 here where we give demonstration to the students you know on welding solidification etcetera. So, those of you who have attended our 201 course ok at the second year level must have experienced you know must must have noticed that you know what is the angle of the torch which is Im important because the operator always comes and tells you that not to hold the torch like this, but to hold the torch you know at an inclination how the filler material is to be you know brought closer to the uh, torch oxyacetylene torch or you know the arc in the arc welding in front of the arc. These all informations are given by the instructor or the demonstrator who are present there because they know it by experience, but that behind that experience are the real theories which are you know known from the fundamentals of fluid dynamics heat transfer and mass transfer. Now, solidification also you have done experiments with solidification you have prepared casting many of you in the 201 uh, course or a similar second year level course and you know which is practiced or which is taught in most of the engineering colleges. So, solidification uh, in the context of you know our own exercise uh, basically what we do we melt uh, aluminum in uh, induction furnace and then ask students to prepare a mold cavity then take aluminum liquid aluminum fill the mold cavity and then prepare a casting. And then what we do we take out the casting basically we make a pulley in our laboratory and then we dissect or trisect the pulley, cut the pulley and then examine its internal structure to see how sound it is and so on and so forth. So, in such context the melting is very very important for us, the solidification time is very very important for us and the final structure is also very very important for us. Because you know if you the melting is energy intensive process you are burning some energy to melt liquid metal. The transfer is also very very important that from the furnace how do you take material and fill ok. For example, you have seen maybe that when you take a bucket in your bathroom and open the tap you must have noticed that the when the stream falls into the bucket you have lot of air bubbles also which get entrained into the liquid. Same thing happens if I take liquid metal and pour the liquid metal into the mold lot of air is going to be entrained and those airs are going to be manifested as bubbles inside the liquid. Also, the microstructure of the casting is going to be dependent at what rate it is being cooled. So, it will depend on what is the dimension of the mold cavity, how fast it can really go. Is the 
mold material to you know if it is a mold material is metallic the cooling is going to be fast if the mold material is sandy the cooling rate is going to be slow so as a result of which the microstructure of the casting is going to be different and once the microstructure is different we all know that its properties are also going to be different it is very important for us to stress that all of these operations that i have discussed you know under the ambit of uh, the application of transport phenomena and materials processing you must have noticed that we are talking about always a high temperature operation so the cost of energy in these operations are extremely important it is by knowing the heat transfer fundamentals that you know uh, we will be able to optimize really the energy which we burn or use in these processes in order to fulfill our end objective but last but not the least i would say that the application of transport phenomena perhaps you know the epitome i say is the human body itself where you can see uh, the application of transport phenomena uh, you know to a, to a wonderful extent for example if you think of the circulatory system what is the circulatory system of the body this is the artery venous and the heart okay the circulation of the blood within the human body is purely a fluid dynamic phenomena only thing is that it is not a you know it's sort of a pipe flow but the pipe is not rigid pipe okay because the arteries may expand or contract depending on the elasticity of the material and of course people who have very you know uh, sedentary lifestyle the flow of blood through their arteries may be you know good enough for the simulation of a rigid artery because the arteries uh, may not be that flexible anymore similarly if you talk of lungs okay or the respiratory system that is a wonderful you know uh, there is a wonderful resemblance between mass transfer concepts as applied to materials processing and the human lungs and in lungs what happens you take oxygen from the atmosphere okay and that oxygen okay gets transferred through the lungs into the blood okay so it is a mass transfer process basically and that's why we say when you do pranayam okay particularly when you take breath and you hold the breath for some time what happens the contact time between the lungs wall as well as the oxygen which is inside the lungs increases and as a result of which the transfer of oxygen into the blood increases so we find an extensive application of mass transfer processes within the human lungs itself and if we talk of you know there are low temperature combustion taking place releasing the energy and what a nice body god has designed you see when you look at the body you find heat is being generated in the body heat is being lost to the surrounding and there's an equilibrium the temperature does not increase it stays at 97.8 always unless you are sick and the system is generating too much of a heat so therefore we don't have to visit any engineering area in order to see the beauty i think right from the morning when you start to dissolve sugar in your cup of tea that's how the transport phenomena sets in in your life and you have no escape as an engineer from this subject so we'll continue in the next lecture and you know, over we'll start Uh, from the fundamentals of the fluid flow okay i'm done huh